If it's Monday, Congress returns after another violent weekend of mass shootings across America. I'll speak with the top Senate negotiator on gun reform talks in Washington in just a moment. As lawmakers signal, they're closing in on a deal. But what is it? Plus, Mexico's president announces he is personally boycotting a U.S.-hosted summit this week after the White House refused to invite the leaders of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. What it means for the U.S. on the world stage and for Biden politically, that's ahead. Plus, Putin strikes key, rocking Ukraine's capital with several blasts over the weekend. We'll have the latest on the ground as Russia digs in. Are they making actual progress? It's a new warning for Ukraine and the West. Welcome to the very first episode of Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd. Thanks for streaming with us wherever and however you get NBC News Now live or on demand. It's as easy as ever. And just like we've done on Sundays, Meet the Press for 75 years. Yeah, that's right. Our diamond anniversary is with the NBA this year. This hour will provide you with all the political news and analysis you need to know. We'll be here every weekday at 4 p.m. Eastern. And we're also rolling out a revamped First Read newsletter, a fresh Meet the Press blog, a podcast version of Meet the Press Now, something we couldn't do before, but we can now. You can check it all out now at meetthepress.com. Speaking of now, let's get started with what's happening in Washington today. Congress is back in session and the Senate negotiations are trying uh, to see if we're going to see some senators hammer out some kind of deal on gun reform that can actually get to the president's desk for real this time. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has set a Friday deadline for any sort of bipartisan agreement. In a few moments, I'll be joined by the leader of those talks, Connecticut Democratic Senator Chris Murphy, who's now saying he's more confident than ever that something can pass. Uh, what that something is and how much of a difference it would make, that remains to be seen. Meanwhile, as these talks ramp up, America's epidemic of gun violence and mass shootings continued unabated over the weekend. At least 12 people were killed in what many deem as mass shootings over the weekend in at least seven locations, including three who died after a gunman opened fire on Philadelphia's busy South Street late Saturday. And don't forget, these types of mass shootings are just a small portion of the carnage of gun violence this country is living with every single day. As for those Senate talks I mentioned, they're confined to just a very small portion of what President Biden asked for when he addressed the nation on gun violence in prime time last week. We need to ban assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. And if we can't ban assault weapons, then we should raise the age to purchase them from 18 to 21. Strengthen background checks. Enact safe storage law and red flag laws. Repeal the immunity that protects gun manufacturers from liability. Address the mental health crisis, deepening the trauma of gun violence and as a consequence of that violence. According to Politico, Senate talks right now are focused on a package that includes enhanced background checks, a way to incentivize states to implement red flag laws, and funding for school safety and some new mental health programs. But folks, the reality is what the president wants is vastly different than what can make it through the Senate. And if that sounds familiar, it's because this same dilemma, the divide between what party leaders want versus what party leaders can actually pass, has plagued virtually everything in President Biden's agenda. Prescription drugs, they can't seem to get there. Health care, they can't seem to get there. Build back better, they haven't built back anything, and so on. So odds are, if anything makes it through the Senate, it's going to be, for lack of a better word, small, perhaps even fractional. And right now, the problem of gun violence is big, huge, affecting just about everyone. Just take a little survey of your own close friends and family and ask them, whether they, they have been in a community or know somebody who has been shot or shot at. Those mass shootings we mentioned just from this weekend, they occurred everywhere from the East Coast to the West Coast, at all times of day, in all kinds of places, to all kinds of people. There were victims that were young, there were victims that were old, victims that were black, victims that were white, victims living in urban areas, and victims living in rural areas. This is one thing we're unified on. This is an entire United States of American problem. No matter where you live, and one where Congress will have to decide how much they can and want to do it, something right now. 
Emily Akeda is on the ground force in Philadelphia. That's the site of that mass shooting I told you about on South Street over the weekend. Actually, some developments in finding out the perpetrator there. But Emily, this is you're in Philadelphia, but the point is this isn't just about Philadelphia. This isn't just about targeted school shootings. This is about gun violence in pretty much everywhere you go in society. Yeah, that's right, Chuck. Good to be here with you on Meet the Press now. Uh, Philadelphians, understandably, among the people that are calling for change, putting pressure on Congress after it saw a steep rise in crime. Really, since 2013, it's continued to climb the number of homicides. Last year, the city setting a new record for the number of people murdered, more than 560 people, and that's more than double than what we saw in 2013. But you take a look at even a single incident, the mass shooting of Saturday, and you see the range of people impacted and how far reaching uh, a single incident can be. 14 people shot, three of those people were killed, and the victims ranged in age from 17 years old to 69 years old. And NBC News, our colleague Gabe Gutierrez, actually talking to uh, the 69 year old. He said that he was just uh, at a bar over my shoulder down the street there when he heard some kind of commotion outside on Saturday evening. He stepped out to see what was going on, heard what he thought were fireworks. Then he looks down at his legs and saw that he was bleeding. A another victim, someone who uh, actually was killed, was, ident was identified as uh, Chris Minners uh, by a teacher's union. He was a 22-year-old who was a residential advisor for second and sixth graders at Girard College. Uh, the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, writing, I think this is really quite poignant, the loss of Chris reminds us that gun violence can and will touch everyone in our nation as long as our elected officials allow it to continue. A gun violence tormenting so many different types of communities, Chuck. Uh, Emily, that was exactly the point we wanted to make today. This is not a specific area. There's not a geographic group, a geographic area, a demographic group, a geographic area uh, that is immune from this. Perhaps the only safe place is an airport after you've gone through TSA. Uh, Emily, thank you. Let's now go over to Capitol Hill. That's where our Capitol Hill correspondent, Ali Vitali, is and reporting on the latest negotiations over gun reform legislation. So, Ali, um, let's break it down here, both on substance, what is being talked about, what is in a potential deal, and timing. Chuck, of course, you're launching this new show at such a pivotal moment here in Congress. And as I've been talking to senators who are now back in town today, it's clear that there's still a momentum. It's why those talks continued virtually and over text over the course of the last week as they tried to figure out where the points of commonality are. We now know your next guest, Senator Chris Murphy, one of the leading negotiators here, is going to be working over dinner tonight. We just caught up with Senator John Cornyn, who's going to be one of his dinner mates, who's part of that smaller group that you see on the screen there, Murphy joined by fellow Democrat Kirsten Cinema, as well as the Republican John Cornyn, who's been deputized by Mitch McConnell, who he's in his office right now, presumably talking about what comes next here. And of course, the other Republican there on the screen, Tom Tillis, that group of four is kind of talking on a parallel track to the larger group that's also bipartisan of nine senators who are working along the lines of what you laid out in your lead there talking about mental health and school safety, but also talking about red flag laws and background checks. I think it was striking in my conversations here just over the last hour or so, hearing from John Cornyn saying that he and Murphy have worked on these kinds of pieces of legislation together in the past. He sees Murphy in this moment right now as being pragmatic, doing what he needs to do to get a deal, even if the provisions that they ultimately agree upon are far less than what people like Biden and the White House and even gun violence prevention advocacy groups say that they want in this moment. And you hear it when you hear Murphy talk, and I'm sure he's going to say this just a few minutes from now when he's on with you. The optim optimism in this building is real, but also for many of these folks, they've been here before. I think the other person who I've really been paying attention to a lot is Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. He has blessed these bipartisan talks. And as I ran into him just a few minutes ago, he said trying to, they're trying to get a bipartisan outcome that makes a difference. And he said, hopefully sometime by the end of the week. That's also the timeline that we heard just a few minutes ago from Murphy himself in the halls of Congress. So clearly, they're trying to flesh out the details here a little bit more as the buckets of policy have remained the same. Now they're trying to put a little bit of meat on the bone here and mm -hmm. see if they can advance this ball a little bit, Chuck. Look, if Schumer and McConnell are agreeing on timing, that's something. Uh, yeah. And that, 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 that isn't something we should overlook. Ali Vitale, 
Uh, you did a great job previewing. My next guest is on set with me right now. Obviously, he's been one of the most outspoken senators on this issue. He's a point person on the current effort to pass legislation in the Senate. It's Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy. How are you, sir? I'm great. Congratulations on the new show. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, it's exciting to be on the anniversary of D-Day. I would mm. say that it's it probably the most American That's of, right. uh, of, and one of our best moments as a country. So at least I won't forget. Uh, let me start with uh, Ali's report there. Um, you're close. Let's talk about timing first. If we don't see a bill at the end of this week, we won't see a bill. No, I, listen, I think we've been making progress every single day. Our goal is to um, get an agreement by the end of the week. But um, I, I think we'll take the time necessary. Remember, we're trying to um, you know, get broad consensus, Republicans and Democrats. We are talking about doing something substantial. Mm -hmm. um, I hear the skepticism about how big this package can be, but I'm not going to support anything that doesn't save lives. I'm not going to support something that just checks a box. And so in order to get a bill that makes a meaningful difference, um, it, it's going to take a little bit of time. Our hope, our goal, is by the end of the week, but we'll take the time that we need. There seem to be four categories that's been reported on. I want to see if you will confirm them. Uh, in, in, you know, getting rid of some of the loopholes in the background check system. Obviously not all of them, it sounds like. Um, the red flag law, not a federal one. Is this about incentivizing states to pass their own or a federal one? I actually don't think it'd be a good idea to have a federal um, okay. red flag law. I think it'd be very inaccessible for local law enforcement to have gotcha. to go into the federal court system. So I support uh, state laws. I think they need uh, some guidance and some funding in order to implement these laws and make sure that everybody knows how to access Carrot them. and stick. You know, so, for instance, everybody had to raise the, driving, uh, the, the drinking age of 21 in order to get your highway funds back in the in the 80s. It, would it be something like that with the red flag laws? I think we're talking about carrots. Okay, all carrots in, in this case. School security, what does that mean? Um, no definition on that yet. There's no doubt there's going to be an increased appetite from school districts to both harden their physical security, invest in security personnel. I think there's bipartisan agreement that we should try to help schools with that. Um, that's part of the discussions. And then this investment in mental health, what is, what is, uh, what is realistic? What's on the table of this mental health spending? Well, I think you know how I sort of feel about the intersection of the conversation between mental health and gun violence. Um, I, you know, sort of submit that we don't have any more mental illness in this country than any other high income nation. We have all of the gun violence. Um, and so I don't necessarily make the connection between mental illness and violence in the way that some of my colleagues do. But we have a broken mental health system in this country, and so we should try to fix it. Um, we are right now fleshing out some of the investments we could make. I think, obviously, it, it will be and should be targeted mm -hmm. um, on the juvenile population, on the profile of these mass shooters, which tend to always be in this 18 to 25 range. I think we can come to agreement on that as well. Here's, so is there any other area that's being explored or are those the four areas? I think there are other areas that are being explored. So I think there's, um, you know, maybe four or five ideas, um, uh, relatively important, but incremental changes to our gun laws. Ra how about raising the age from 18 to 21 on, 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 on these assault rifles? I, I, obviously, I support that. The president supports it. It's just a question of whether that can get 60 votes in the Senate. Rick Scott signed a bill as governor he for did. it. He did. Um, even Texas, uh, at least with their handguns, at one point had it at 21 on handguns. I mean, is, you would think there's some wiggle room. I think there's certainly Republican support for raising the age. I don't know whether there are 60 votes yet. And right yeah. now, my entire focus is on what can get 60 votes. And I guess from the big picture, New York Times did a, 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 very, a pretty exhaustive, and you probably saw, of sort of looking at what, what laws were violated with each, each of these mass shootings. What's really striking is in the last five years, no laws were violated. Right. These were legally purchased weapons. Now, the things that we see here are, number one, no th things that could impact these last five years of mass shootings. Raising the age, that doesn't appear to be on the table, or a waiting period. Well, properly administered red flag laws in these states clearly could have made a difference. It could have made a difference uh, in Texas. And how? I how? If you, with, with the Texas law, there was no reports of this, of this young man at the time, unless you're saying five years' worth of mental health uh, checks in a school system might have made this incident not happen. But that, that's, a, that's a reach, is it not? Well, I, I think you, you do have to look at the totality of the circumstances. More evidence is coming out every single day about what he was saying uh, online in the lead-up to the shooting. But again, 
the focus has to be on the everyday gun violence that happens in this country. I know the country is focused on these mass shootings, mm -hmm. rightfully so. But every single day, 100 people are dying from guns. And so if you are able to tighten up our background check system, you're going to save lives here in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. in Bridgeport, Connecticut, in New Orleans, Louisiana. We've got to be focused on the totality of gun violence mm -hmm. in this nation, not just the mass shootings. If you can't do this, look, John Cornyn has basically praised what you're describing here as a very pragmatic solution, that you should be able to get the votes for this. Should. Yeah. I don't, I have yet to count 10 Republicans. Yeah. Have you? So sometimes when we go away for a week, right, we go home for a week, sensitive negotiations like this fall apart. This week, the opposite is happening because my colleagues went home and heard the same thing I did. Parents are frightened to death. They are frightened to death for their kids, and they are frightened to death that government isn't going to be able to respond to the most fundamental concern that parents have, the safety of their kids. I think senators are coming back to town today with a newfound resolve to get something done. I get it. There's a reason why we haven't passed substantial gun reform in 30 years. This is the most politically complicated, most emotionally fraught issue we deal with. I think something different is happening right All now. All right, but look what happened to the Buffalo congressman, uh, uh, Congressman Jacobs here, who suddenly all of his support went away when he just expressed the openness for an assault weapons ban. It, it, that, that, did that not send a message to some Republican elected officials? Right, but look what happened in 2018, where um, anti-gun violence candidates won all over the country campaigning on universal background checks. So I, I don't doubt that there are different politics on this issue in the Republican and Democratic side of the aisle, but you can win in this, this country. New York State in the suburbs of Buffalo, though. Like that expand, just happened. You can win in this country on running on things like expanding background checks and red flag laws. Not everywhere. And isn't that part of the issue? Is you got to, you got to that politically until someone loses for having, uh, for basically being too pro-gun, the politics of this ma doesn't change dramatically. If we pass something along the lines of what we are contemplating, um, every single person who votes for it will be running on it. We will pass something that is broadly popular, more popular now than ever before. In the wake of Uvalde, in the wake of the shootings last weekend, there is a popular uprising in this country to do something. And what we pass. It will be mainstream, mm -hmm. it will be bipartisan, and it will be popular. Uh, you are an eternal optimist on this. Um, if it doesn't happen, then what? I'm devastated, and I fear for the future of this country. I mean, I think this is a test of democracy. I think there are a lot of people out there who have been doubting whether democracy can deliver for them for a decade. And now, at this moment, if we're unable to put our politics aside and do something to guarantee the safety of our kids, I think it's another blow to the health of American democracy. I think it's a big moment for us. Um, you spend an, a lot of time focused on foreign affairs as well, and I think you have a particular interest in Latin America. I'm just curious. We had some breaking news over the last couple hours. Uh, the Mexican president's going to boy personally boycott the U.S.-hosted Summit of Americas um, over us not inviting Nicaragua, the leaders of Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela. First of all, the decision by President Biden, was it the right one? Um, I think the president made the right decision, but I think that our policy to continue to isolate the Cuban mm -hmm. regime and the Venezuelan regime um, continues to be a thorn in our side. And it is time for us to explore ways to try to midwife talks in Venezuela, to uh, try to r continue to reform our relationship with Cuba as a mechanism of opening up new areas and new avenues of cooperation with our partners in the region. This is just another sign that our Venezuela policy and our Cuba policy is badly broken. But this is now, I mean, this is kind of an embarrassing moment that, that our neighbor won't come to the summit of the Americas. Well, but this has a lot to do with his domestic uh, politics. I don't know that this is necessarily a death blow to the relationship. No, I'm not saying it's a death blow, but relationship it, it's between the United States and Mexico. When you look at what China's trying to do in Latin America and what we're trying to do in Latin America, not the best moment. Yeah, and listen, we've got to have different answers for our partners in Latin America. We've got to have more economic partnerships like those that are being offered by the Chinese. This is, um, should be a lesson for us that we need to do more in the hemisphere. Chris Murphy, it's good to see you. Thank you, Thank you for coming on. Thanks. It. Coming up, if it's Monday, we're gearing up for another round of primary contests tomorrow. We're still dealing with the fallout of results from three weeks ago in Battleground, Pennsylvania. What it all means for the midterms next and later, we'll go live to Kiev after Putin blasted the capital city with missile strikes again over the weekend. He's threatening to attack even more targets. You're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. As a bunch of states prepare for primary elections tomorrow, it's somewhat of a superish Tuesday tomorrow for what it's worth. Just not a lot of headline races. Pennsylvania finally has a result in the Republican Senate primary nearly three weeks after voters there went to the polls. The Republican Senate candidate David McCormick officially conceded to the Trump-endorsed uh, candidate Mehmet Oz on Friday. McCormick congratulated Oz on his victory and promised to throw his support behind him in the general election against the Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman. Meanwhile, Fetterman, who handily won his primary last month, despite suffering a stroke the weekend before the election, a stroke that is just that he's just now saying nearly cost him his life. Dasha Burns joins us now with more from Philadelphia. And Dasha, it seems like we've got uh, the health story on Fetterman's side. We had the recount story. And now that the Republican situation is settled with Oz, there's a lot more focus and potential scrutiny on what we know about John Fetterman's health. Enlighten us, Dasha. Yeah, Chuck, great to be with you for your debut show on NBC News Now. Congratulations. Thank and, you. and look, we have now the heart patient versus the heart surgeon. This sets up quite the story for the general election. And you're right, on Friday, quite a stunning admission from Fetterman that he almost died from this stroke. He released a pretty candid statement alongside a letter from his cardiologist where some more details were revealed of how he's essentially neglected his health for the last five years. His cardiologist saying that he was actually diagnosed with AFib back in 2017. He was supposed to come for follow-ups. He was supposed to be taking medication. He did not do those things, and that led to a stroke that that nearly killed him. His cardiologist saying that now he is taking the right steps, that if he follows doctor's orders, he should be fine to campaign and to uh, hold office if he is elected. Uh, but this is not small. Like This is a big deal <laughs> here. And it's going to be a story throughout this, uh, throughout this election. The question that I have for voters that I'll be asking is, does this make Fetterman seem weaker or does it make him more relatable in a country where there's a very complicated cumbersome health care system to navigate. And he himself even, uh, you know, said in the statement that men typically uh, tend yeah. to ignore these sorts of signs of trouble. So, uh, you know, how will this play with voters? How is the Oz campaign going to use this uh, in, in their uh, right. side of the story here? We're going to have uh, a lot to watch out for. Yeah, you know, I guess, the, Dasha, the question I have with, with Fetterman is that it does feel as if they're piecing out the story. And it isn't Fetterman himself who's telling us these updates. It's his wife. Does, it, it, is he healthy enough? Is he not healthy enough to do these updates himself? Yeah, well, he had a written statement that he put out, but you're right, Giselle Fetterman, his wife, has very much essentially stepped in for him over the last few weeks. She's been holding uh, campaign events. She was there uh, at his election night rally, and we're going to be sitting down with her actually uh, later this week, so we will have more updates. But right now, he is kind of sidelined. He is not back on the campaign trail, and his campaign, and, and Giselle will ask her about this, but haven't yet said when he will be able to, uh, to come back. And now that there is a candidate on the Republican side who's going to hit the ground running here. Uh, I, how long is he going to be sitting this out? And right. will that harm him if, if it's you know weeks or months? We'll, we'll have to see, Chuck. And on the Republican side, has Dr. Oz uh, come out and endorsed Doug Mastriano yet, the Republican nominee for governor? Is he ready to run as a ticket with the entire Republican statewide slate? Well, that's going to be really interesting to see. Oz, since he's received the nomination, has thanked McCormick, but he's stayed rather quiet. Uh, we'll see what comes out in the in the next week or so. But these two are very different candidates, Chuck. Uh, and whether or not they align, how closely they align themselves on the campaign trail is also going to say a lot about uh, the the stage of the Republican yeah. Party and the direction uh, that the GOP is headed here. Very hard for Oz to totally walk away since they are both received the Trump endorsement. Dasha Burns in Philadelphia for us. Dasha, thank you. And speaking of the Trump endorsement, it was Dr. Oz. He, it's proof that his mega authenticity uh, was enough to get that uh, nomination in Pennsylvania. But some Republicans are increasingly wary of the chaos the former president's attention can bring. He did bring some chaos in Pennsylvania, but it was chaos Oz desperately needed in a crowded primary. 
Others don't need it. In fact, according to new NBC News reporting, some Republicans really wish Trump would just stay out of their upcoming primaries altogether. In states like Nevada, Wisconsin, and Missouri, some say they're turned off by Trump's fixation on the false claim that the 2020 election was stolen. And some Republicans in those states are frustrated that Trump's influence over GOP primaries could have serious implications for control of state houses or even the U.S. Senate come November. For a little bit more on this, let me bring in NBC News senior political reporter Natasha Karecki. So, Natasha, you know, it's interesting to me, just as you had this story that you were writing, I noticed Adam Laxalt, who is a Trump-endorsed candidate in Nevada, is in a more competitive primary uh, than he planned on being. He's now running an ad. Earlier, he ran ads from Trump. Now he's running an endorsement ad from Ron DeSantis. Is this yet another example of Trump fatigue in Republican primaries? I think, it, I think it is one example. There's a lot of criticism of Adam Laxalt focusing way too heavily on Trump's endorsement. It was in every radio um, hit in, in all of his ads, and people were saying that he was just focusing on that way too much. Um, but overall, you're right. I mean, what we were hearing in story after story from different states, what Republicans were telling me is that there was just this Trump fatigue. It was they were tired of hearing about 2020. And in a lot of these states, the Republicans were saying, hey, we already corrected a lot of the issues. There's the, the voter fraud issues he was talking about um, to the extent that there were any. Um, they've addressed it in laws, but he's still talking about it. Um, so, so that is one thing that Republicans were just what I kept hearing more and more, the most common phrase was, please, let's move on. Mostly that was from 2020, but in some cases that was from Trump himself. Um, now, don't get me wrong. Candidates want his endorsement. It's opt absolutely the most sought after endorsement um, in the Republican Party. At the same time, that doesn't mean that the party itself in those states think it's the best thing for them. Um, they think in cases like in our story, we pointed out Missouri Senate race yeah. and Eric Greitens. If he were to get the, the endorsement from Trump, Republicans fear that that will end up putting into play a race that should be a very safe seat for them. Natasha, it feels like, and we've been sort of hinting at this for a few weeks now, there really is, the party wants to move away from Trump more than it wants to move away from Trumpism. And, and in some ways that in this, this fight over the Trump endorsement, I think exposes that, yes? Yeah, that's that that is that is very true. I mean, in, in the Adam Laxalt case you just talked about, I had people saying, mm, I'm not going to vote for Laxalt. I don't care that Trump endorsed him. But if Trump came here to campaign for Laxalt, I would completely come and see Trump. I mean, they support Trump and they they support, you know, his philosophies. They right. love him. But they also think it's we might we might be open to more faces, as we also reported in yeah. the Wisconsin story. They um, they wanted Ron DeSantis over Trump in, in 2024, which also was interesting. No, it is. Well, you know, no matter how, how much you might like a band when they first come out, if they keep playing the same songs over and over again, you get kind of tired of it. And there's something about Trump's hits. He plays the same hits over and over. Perhaps that is a little bit of this problem as well. Natasha Karecki, uh, some terrific reporting there from Trump World. Natasha, thank you. Coming up, a majority of Americans say gun violence can be prevented. Many Republicans, though, are ready to accept mass shootings as a reality of life and freedom in this country. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. More than four in 10 Republicans say they have accepted that gun violence is simply the price we pay for living in a free society. That was according to some new poll numbers released today from CBS. In fact, another CBS poll conducted in the wake of the Uvalde school shooting, the majority of Americans, 72%, say they believe gun violence is something we can stop with enough effort. 28 percent of all Americans say it's something Americans just need to accept. But among Republicans, as I noted there, 44 percent say the gun violence of the past month is just the cost of living in America. We're seeing this divide play out in real time this midterm season, even in areas touched by recent tragedy. As I mentioned earlier with Chris Murphy, Republican Congressman Chris Jacobs is no longer seeking re-election. Basically, one week after he voiced potential support for gun control legislation, specifically an assault weapons ban, in the wake of the mass shooting in a Buffalo grocery store, just miles away from his district. Joined now by our first Meet the Press Now panel of our new era, Washington Post congressional reporter Mariana Sotomayor, Democratic pollster and NBC News political analyst Cornell Belcher, and Republican strategist Brad Todd. Mariana, let me start with you. Chris Jacobs, this is not, uh, he's not a bomb thrower. Member of Congress is a New York Republican, and sometimes they're, they're 
seems like more of a workhorse guy than a show horse guy. Um, what he said seemed sort of almost like a normal reaction that any elected official might give. Well, yeah, I might be more open to this than I have ever been before. And then within a week, what happened? Literally one week, and he decided, you know, I can't run in this atmosphere. In the time where he said, listen, I, I, I've seen mass shootings happen, happening in this country, but something is different when it's in your own backyard. He doesn't represent Buffalo. It's the district right outside of it. Mm -hmm. But he was born and raised there. And then Uvalde happened. And he has kids. And he said, you know what? We need to do something about this. I can actually vote to ban assault weapons, maybe limit high-capacity magazines, raise the age limit. But the moment he said that, like, like we just said, one week later, he said, I'm out because, and he has said this since in interviews, immediately all the Republican endorsements that he had pulled out. He was getting calls. He was getting texts. His phone number got leaked. And he was being told, you can't survive in this atmosphere. And it's something that, you know, Republicans, as they look at the atmosphere, yeah. they, they say, you know what? This is a Republican district. We can just get someone else who kind of toes the party line on this front. Brad, was Chris Jacobs right? Or did he panic? Could he have, like, stuck it out? And, you know, I, I'm watching, and it's for different reasons. I'm watching a guy like Tom Rice, who looks like he might survive. It's sort of like, sometimes you take the initial punch, and then you might be able to make it. Was he right? Uh, I think the panic was when he came out for gun control. I mean... What does the definition of coming out for gun control you, mean? You, you know, when, once he said he could vote with Democrats who, we know, who, who, who we know want to ban The specific. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think, just as you pointed out, right, most of these last few deadly crimes have been all been legal other than all the parts that they were the crime part. Uh, and New York has some of the strictest gun control laws in the country, second maybe to California, who's also had mass shootings. We know that the gun control answers that Democrats are proposing won't work. And so Republican voters are, are voters who understand that. And I think that he went going against his base, he went against his philosophy, and that is what, what put him there. You know, it's interesting, Cornell, that Pew came out today with another one of their longer-term studies, and this was not a gun-related question, but it was about whether, essentially, do you use government to protect, protect people from themselves? or not. And it was essentially, as you not, not, might not be surprised, a large majority of Democrats believe government should pass laws that help people protect essentially themselves themselves from, them, from themselves. Uh, and a majority of Republicans said, no, you know, that isn't government's job to do that. It seems to apply here to this gun debate. No, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a problem, is this, this ideal that, um, and by the way, this is why I, I have, and I heard, listened to the interview with Senator Murphy, and of course they, they've got to put out sort of good faith ethic, and they've got to sort of go to the negotiation table and try to actually move something. Uh, Chuck, you and I have been watching a long time. I think I've seen this play a couple of times. Uh, and in the end, there's no way Mitch McConnell's going to allow any of this to happen. In the end, he's going to pull back and say, you know what, Democrats were too radical. They were trying to do too many things that we don't agree with. But there's, I'm not falling for the banana in the tailpipe. The, the Republicans and Jacob... He's right in line. They're not going to. They're not going to allow this to happen. And the, and the question becomes: Do they pay a price? Seventy percent, seventy-two percent of women want to ban assault rifles. That's not. That's not about being Democrat or Republican. That is across the board. When you get into those sort of numbers, the moderate middle swath of this country wants something to happen on guns, and, and Republicans are saying no. Let's still, there's something we could, that you could do, though. We could talk about the fact that this is a software problem, not a hardware problem. No one's talking about social media as impact on these on these terrible tragedies we've turned broadcasters made broadcasters out of every teenager in america mm -hmm. and kids who want fame and are willing to do really bad things for it now have a way to do it we can have a conversation in congress right now about limiting age to social media maybe you shouldn't be able to get a social media account till you're 21 maybe we ought to talk about that social media reform is not the answer to this and i don't think most americans buy social media reform as the answer to this gun reform is the answer to this mariana by the way one of the points that uh senator murphy made to me before he left was they're not looking for 10 Republican votes. They need 15 or 20. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants just 10. They want the cover of that, which implies to me they need Mitch McConnell's vote. Is he willing to vote? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I can't even finish the answer. I, look, if, if, if it sounds like Cornyn and McConnell are discussing this right now. Yeah, I mean, Cornyn said in the first couple days when he said, you know what, I'm willing to negotiate, I will vote for whatever we decide to if there are 10 to 15 I actually think he's at 15 to 20 members, mm -hmm. so or senators. That is a huge question. I think the right the right math here is what you do on this or any subject in this Congress has to be something that 
maybe 80 people in the U.S. Senate can win a primary on. Win a primary. Right. So 80 people means a so lot we're saying of the same. In some ways, we're saying the same thing in different ways. But I don't know how you find 15 or Joe 20 Biden Republicans. Joe promised yeah, us he would know. do that. He yeah. promised us he'd be that kind of president. He's, and he's out of this conversation. And Mitch McConnell has let us know what kind of, <laughs> what kind of minority leader is time and time again. It's not going to happen. Could you come up with 15? I don't think so. Yeah. Because if you even take the number of Republicans who are retiring, that's not 10. That is still not enough. That those right. are people who are already in the conversations could be open to it. It doesn't seem like you don't think to me some of the usual number. suspects like I, I don't the Lisa I don't I wouldn't count on the Lisa Murkowski vote. But, but automatically you, based on the last you, you right, could get an right. overwhelming majority exactly. to talk about mental health and about that making sure more mental health records are in the background yeah. check system. If the fact that we are not talking exclusively about that, on which there ought to be about 100 percent agreement, yeah. that's bad leadership. I, Chuck Schumer. I, 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 I don't get why 18 to 21 is controversial. Well, I don't get from it 18 either. to 21. It, it's why, right. Explain why that's controversial. Because over half the people in this country do not go to college when they leave high school. They mm -hmm. don't go to the comfy confines of a fraternity house. They instead go get an apartment and they get a job. And for you to tell them that the first three years of their working lives, my mm -hmm. dad lived in trailers working for the lineman for AT&T when he was 19. Mm -hmm. To tell that kind of person, you don't live in the best neighborhood and you don't get to defend your home, nobody that's said, just not right. Nobody said it's limiting every weapon from right. that person. Why, why, you know, it's about one. It currently are limiting, handguns are currently limited yeah. to people under, under 21. And so right now it's only rifles and shotguns are available to you under age 21 well, under federal law. That's the point is that there, nobody's saying you outline all of them. There's nothing about the Second Amendment that says it's absolute. It's, we currently have restrictions on the books. Mm -hmm. Republicans are willing to enforce those restrictions right now. At some point, at some point we, we have to, yeah. it, listen, it's, uh, that's not acceptable to the majority of Americans right now. And at some point, the majority of Americans are going to have to make these guys pay for where they are on this. And, Chuck, when you have 42 percent of, of, of moms yeah. are very concerned that there's going to be a shooting at their school, right. this has to change. Look, if something does get signed, though, it will, I do think that it will surprise a lot of people, a lot of the public that has tuned out Congress because they assume nothing ever gets done. So I'll be curious <laughs> to see if they do sign even this small incremental thing we're talking about. I want to change subjects here. Before I do, I gotta go, I'm going to go to Mike Memoli. He's in L.A. covering the Summit of Americas. And, Mike, uh, it's supposed to, it's already gotten underway, but there's a big sort of uh, skunk in the punch bowl here for the Summit of Americas. Our neighbor to the south, the president of Mexico, uh, AMLO, he basically said since President Biden refused to invite the leaders of Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba, he is personally boycotting. Uh, how much air does this take out of the Summit of the Americas balloon? Well, listen, Chuck, the White House really is downplaying this, as you'd expect. Today was the rip the Band-Aid moment. Make it clear we're not inviting these dictators, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua. We're still going to have a fulsome summit. This is what the White House is saying. Mexico is going to be in attendance. They have made commitments that are going to be part of the big rollout this week about issues like migration and climate, mm -hmm. the economy. It's just that AMLO, the president there, won't be there. Now, some of this is about Trump, and some of this is self-inflicted in terms of the fallout for the Biden administration. I was at the Summit of the Americas in Panama in 2015. You remember the U.S., President Obama really basking in the goodwill generated from Latin American countries as they were working to normalize relations with Cuba. He had that historic meeting at that summit with Raul Castro. Trump comes along and undoes all of Trump, uh, the Obama normalization effort. But where this is somewhat self-inflicted, and you have a panelist there who can also speak to the politics of this, Biden's problem with Latino voters as well as anybody, the Biden administration was not willing to really go back to the Obama position and work towards normalization, one, because of their concern about South Florida voters, and partially right. because Senator Bob Menendez is really an, a, an incredible critic of doing yeah. just that. So the, the Biden administration, they say this is going to be a, a, a big week with a lot of commitments made. AMLO will get his White House meeting next month, uh, an invitation there. Uh, yeah. But there's no doubt that this is a setback for a time when Biden wants to focus on democracies versus autocracies, and he doesn't have the buy-in from our southern neighbor. Mike Memoli, uh, with that report for us in L.A., uh, who's covering some of the America's for us. Mike, thank you. Cornell, I think he was uh, referring to you and, and your understanding of polling here. <laughs> you know, before Bernie Sanders was a national figure and before democratic socialism was a thing, um, the Cuba policy that Obama pursued in South Florida wasn't unpopular. Mm -hmm. it, was it, was, it was divided, but it wasn't unpopular. Then the S word happened, and then it went south. Is that what's happened here? Do you accept that, uh, do you accept that premise? I, I accept the premise that, that the president couldn't, couldn't invite 
the, the Cubans. I mean, mm -hmm. and look, listen, the political downside of the Mexican president not being there is less than the political downside if he invited Cuba, yeah. the Cubans there. Not, 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 not even close. And it, yes, it is about South Florida. Mariana, I was stunned at the shots AMLO took at Menendez in his statement, <laughs> at Trump, at the Republican Party, at Biden. I mean, he was... Uh, he was getting very political. Yeah, all over the place. But I, I actually wanted to circle back to what you were just mentioning about Hispanic voters and the socialism. I just came back from Las Vegas, and, and I mean, I'm Hispanic. I, I have been to South Florida. I know I've been to Texas. And one thing you constantly hear is that socialism word is a problem. It has bled into other states and other Hispanic communities. And Republicans are really trying to make gains right now in all of these areas. And the one thing that even maybe beyond the socialism aspect that a lot of these members in the Hispanic community are seeing is, you know, why is this Democratic Party that I voted for, that I grew up yeah. on, that my grandparents voted for, they're moving too much to the left? Like, what is left for me? Brad. Hijacking of the Democratic Party by young, white, college-educated liberals is going to be its demise in swing states. <laughs> it, it is. Uh, it's, and Florida's the top of that. Well, no, I mean, I, I was just going to say, you're seeing, I mean, this, the Cuba policy wasn't controversial until the S word. Is that fair? I mean, well, as it, controversial. Well, and also, it's not just Cubans in South Florida. It's, right. it's, it's in Nicaraguans, Colombians. I mean, it's... it's, it, it, but, it, it's but it does play differently among, and you know, it's not, they're not monolith. It, it does play differently among South Americans yeah. than it does, say, Mexican Americans and, and, and others. There is some bifurcation it's around It's true, this. but the loss, the C Colombians didn't vote Democratic down in South Florida for the first time in 2020. Uh, that's why Donna Shalala is not a member of Congress anymore. Yeah. Yes. You know, one thing that's just I, I want to mention very briefly is the fact that a lot of Republicans, too, are talking about, hey, in the House, if we take back the majority, we want these kind of discussions. We yeah. want to be talking to Central America, to South America, because there's other countries where things are getting worse. Well, oh, real quickly, yeah. I like our chances against a guy who said, I'm going to build a wall <laughs> between us and All Mexico. Right. All right, guys. <laughs> Thank you for this. It's a wonderful, smart first panel. So thank you. Still ahead, we're going to head to Ukraine as Russia mounts new air attacks on Kyiv. What does that mean? We're going to bring you the latest on the ground with Ali Aruzi. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Britain is now joining the U.S. in providing Ukraine with longer-range missile systems, but it comes as Vladimir Putin warns the West against helping arm Ukraine with weapon systems like that. And as Russia attacks Kyiv for the first time in weeks, rockets struck the Ukrainian capital yesterday. There have been no reports of any deaths, but Russia claims the strikes destroyed tanks and other vehicles sent to Ukraine by Eastern European allies. Ukraine's deputy defense minister says Kyiv is constantly under threat, even as residents and diplomats begin returning to the city. In an interview that aired yesterday, Putin said Russia would strike new targets at the West supplied Ukraine with long range missiles. Ali Aruzi joins me now from Kyiv, and also with me is Clint Watts, former U.S. Army Infantry Officer and former FBI Special Agent. He's now an NBC News national security analyst. He's going to help me analyze Russia's path in the East. But Ali, uh, these Russian strikes at Kyiv, uh, were they, did they do real damage? Uh, or was it meant to essentially put an exclamation point on Putin's warning to the West? Uh, hi, Chuck. It was certainly a warning from Putin. Well, what they damaged, according to the Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians were very keen to take the world media out there to show exactly what the Russians have hit, was a rail repair depot. They had uh, grain delivery wagons in there, which is so essential to the world's food supply. And that's what they destroyed there. But as you mentioned, the Russians said, no, this was a legitimate target. These were tanks that were delivered to the Ukrainians uh, by Eastern European allies. And the Russians have said since the beginning of this war that those are legitimate targets. But from all the video that was put out by the Ukrainians, by the international media that was there, there were no evidence of any tanks there, just uh, grain delivery wagons in that area. So it really was a message from Putin, and it came at exactly the same time when he'd been warning about those new missile systems not coming into Ukrainian hands. And, and Ali, what is the definition of long range here, right? It does seem as if we say media, we're sending only medium ranged missiles. The Brits are saying they're sending longer range missiles. Is, what is the distinction? 
Well, their, their cap, the missiles that the U.S. and the British are sending, the U.S. has about a 45-mile range. The British ones have a 50-mile range. So really, Chuck, they're defensive missiles. These are not missiles that can strike deep into the heart of Russia. These are missiles that can take out an offensive attack by the Russians because both the British and the Americans, who are so supportive mm -hmm. of the Ukrainians, don't want this to escalate into Russian territory. They want to be very careful about that. And they got a promise from the Ukrainians that even these mid-range rockets won't be used into Russian territory. So they're still being very careful about this. But the Ukrainians think that these missiles, even though the range is limited right. to 50 miles, will tip the scale into their favor. I'm sure a lot of people are shaking their head. It's okay for Russia to attack Ukraine, but it's not okay for Ukraine to attack Russia. Um, I think any time you've had a conversation about bullies, uh, I think we know how that ends. Anyway, Ali Aruzi, uh, in on the ground force in Ukraine. Ali, thank you. Let me move to Clint Watts. Clint, break it down. What is going on in the East? And it certainly looks like the Russian progress is real. The question is, is it, you know, are, are they making progress fast enough before they sort of lose their own uh, ability to, uh, to do reinforcements in the East? Yeah, two interesting dimensions, Chuck, is what do you win if you destroy everything that's there? I think that's going to be one of the big questions in the Donbass. It, it will almost be unlivable, at least at this point. It's just severe indirect fire artillery and missiles. That's the predominant action that's going on day to day. Russians are making slow and, and incremental progress at different points. The battle almost is entirely around Severodonetsk right now. That area is very key to the Luhansk Oblast, uh, the region there. And that city has been really the scene of a battle going on more of two weeks. The Russians took part of it uh, last week. The Ukrainian counteroffensive over the last few days has taken back some of that ground. So it's interesting to watch this tug of war that's going back and forth in the remaining strongholds of Luhansk, that region. That is only half, Chuck, of Donbass. Mm -hmm. uh, other axes that they've tried to advance on from Izium uh, down from the north, uh, they have not had great success. They were originally trying to push for larger envelopments of Ukrainian forces. Right. That didn't happen. You see the Ukrainians piling in there. And the one thing to watch those Ukrainian casualties. They've definitely picked up, and we really don't have a good handle on the state of the Ukrainian military at this point. And, uh, Clint, the need for these mid-range, long-range missile systems, however you want to describe them, these 45 to 50 mile an hour ranges that the Ukrainians need. I know the East is sparser, so I assume that is why they need these weapon systems? That's right, Chuck. Two, part, two parts to that. One, they need standoff. Right now, most of the artillery and counter battery that the Ukrainians are using, which gets better, they have the M777 and a few other weapons that are coming in, it's pretty limited in terms of how far they can reach, which means standoff going to be achieved by Russian artillery. They have a lot of artillery. That's an essential part of Russian uh, mechanized warfare is the use of a lot of artillery. Separately, they want to be able to hit in the rear areas and the rear lines of the Russians. Right now, the Russians can move around largely unimpeded, and their lines of communication and logistics are very solidified. Add those uh, weapons to the Ukrainian arsenal going out to 45 or 50 miles, that changes the situation. Uh, that makes it very different for, for the Russian military in terms of their freedom of maneuver. Clint Watts, it's always, uh, you give us uh, a pretty easy way to understand uh, the daily machinations of this war, particularly what's happening these days. Clint Watts, thank you. Well, that does it for us this hour. Thank you for tuning in to what is our debut of Meet the Press Now on NBC News Now. It's your home for news in the moment and analysis all the time without fear or favoritism. And since this is episode one on News Now, I want to take a moment to remind people of our mission here to share with you what you need to know about what's happening in Washington and in American politics. And most importantly, explaining why it happened and why it matters to you. We cover politics as it is. It's a mission that's more important than ever in these increasingly divisive times. So folks, I've always been a big believer in finding new ways to reach new audiences. So we know where you are and putting Meet the Press on NBC News Now five days a week is at the forefront of where we want to be in streaming news. It was a no-brainer. We know you are here because you are simply looking for smart, honest news and analysis. That's all, which has been and always will be the driving force behind Meet the Press. So favorite us, subscribe to us, bookmark us. We will be on the front lines giving you honest, straightforward reporting on what's happening in American politics and why. We call balls, strikes, and yes, BS 
when necessary. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back with more Meet the Press Now on NBC News Now tomorrow. My colleague Tom Costello picks things up, filling in for Hallie Jackson now after the break. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.